On January 21st, 1968, after months of gathering thousands of troops and supplies at the border with Laos, the North Vietnamese army surprised and encircled the isolated American base of Khe Sanh. There was no way in or out, but the devil dogs trusted each other, cleaned their rifles, and fixed their bayonets to get the job done. For over 77 days, the U.S. Marine garrison would fight against overwhelming odds without a single day of rest. The 6,000 Marines had to resist the violent push of over 16,000 NBA eager to overrun the base, and the Tet Offensive would be drained from men that could have been used elsewhere. Artillery bombardment, mortar fire, and airstrikes carrying explosives or napalm would lead to a deadly cacophony that tested the guts of the outnumbered Leathernecks. The Siege of Kassan ultimately became one of the longest and bloodiest battles of the Vietnam War. Circling Kassan Kassan was a village near the border with Laos and south of the DMZ, or Demilitarized Zone, divided into North and South Vietnam. During the 1960s, the village was the local seat of the government of the Bru Montagnard, a local tribe that made a living out of coffee plantations. In 1962, the United States Military Command Vietnam, or MACV, began building an Army Special Forces base near Kassan. The purpose of the base was to train local men to fight against the Northern Communists and serve as a deterrent of enemy forces that sought to reach the city of Laos. From this base, the Army also launched patrols into Laos to conduct reconnaissance operations on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Then, in 1963, the Army built an airfield near an old French port. Three years later, the U.S. Marines built their own base next to the Special Forces section, from where they would begin organizing their own operations in the region. Soon, the small Marine position was reinforced to regimental strength, as NBA, or North Vietnamese Army, activity increased in the surrounding hills. Operation Prairie 4 was then launched in April of 1967, followed by Operations Crockett and Ardmore. During this time, Marines and NBA firefights continually broke out to control the hillsides surrounding the Kassan base. As October closed in, NBA activity and movement in the region dramatically increased. The communist forces began to gather and concentrate thousands of troops for a possible offensive. Artillery and ammunition depots and artillery pieces were sighted by intelligence forces, which alarmed the U.S. military command about a significant NBA threat around Kassan. Still, some officers doubted that the communists would dare attack the U.S. forces when peace talks were already underway for the Tet talks. But others, like President Lyndon B. Johnson and General William Westmoreland, commander of the Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, believed otherwise. Both men considered that the NVA was deliberately targeting Kassan and other South Vietnamese regions and cities to gain a political edge over the Americans for the upcoming peace talks. Westmoreland based his suspicions around what happened during the First Indochina War, in which the French were encircled and defeated at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954, giving the Vietnamese enough leverage to obtain their independence during the Geneva Peace Conference. Now history could repeat itself. Preparing for the offensive. The NBA troops that surrounded Kassan comprised two infantry divisions and several artillery and armored regiments, and between 20,000 and 30,000 communist soldiers, including support troops, were rounded up in the vicinity. As the US military command realized the extent of the offensive, they only had two options abandon the base, or reinforce it for an imminent attack. President Johnson and Westmoreland wanted the base to be held at all costs. In contrast, Maxwell Taylor, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and commander of the 101st Airborne during World War II, wanted the position to be abandoned due to its isolated location. In the end, the President's suggestion became an order, and Operation Scotland was launched to prepare the Marines for a possible NVA attack. The positions surrounding the base were then reinforced with supplies and men, and by January of 1968, 6,000 Marines and Army troops were entrenched and expecting an enemy attack soon. General Westmoreland also entertained the idea that if an all-out confrontation broke out near the demilitarized zone and Kassan was overrun, chemical or nuclear weapons could be used. Still, the few men that knew about this top-secret course of action hoped that the Marines could handle the defense with conventional weapons. Because of the timing and location, the only way to deploy more troops or supplies was through airdrops or helicopter landings, as the NBA had slowly surrounded the base from all flanks. Still, morale was high among the American soldiers, and they would need it as the air stiffened as the days went by. Then, on January 21st, 1968, the sky lit up. Havoc rained down from the sky as thousands of enemy artillery and mortar rounds began to pummel the isolated American base. It was time to fight. 
the attacks. The massive artillery bombardment from the NVA was delivered with pinpoint accuracy. It was midnight, and although the Marines were on high alert, they were surprised by the sheer scale of the attack. While the Leathernecks raced for cover, the NVA launched a series of coordinated attacks from several positions. Then, at 3 in the morning, the NVA's 6th Battalion attacked the Marines on Hill 861. An hour later, a second artillery barrage leveled most of the ground defenses that protected the base. Some of the shells hit the main ammunition dump and detonated most of the artillery and mortar rounds the Marines had stored, causing more damage inside the base. Even worse, another shell hit a stash of tear gas that saturated an entire area and forced the Marines to leave the area or fight with gas masks. Fourteen Marines were lost, and another fifty were wounded. Then, after the barrage was ceased, the NVA retreated. However, a series of explosives set around the base detonated before the Marines could breathe fresh air. To exacerbate the situation, the top brass was fooled by the Communist forces by making them believe that most of their forces were centered around Kisan. But they were not. The NBA and Viet Cong launched over 70,000 men in a series of attacks that overran the entire DMZ on more than a hundred different locations. It was the beginning of the Tet Offensive. The Army then sent Huey helicopters to support the outnumbered American and South Vietnamese personnel before evacuating them. For the following weeks, the Marines kept resisting at Khe Sanh and its surrounding outposts, but the NBA never let them rest, and morale began to take a blow. In addition, ammunition and food soon began to run short, and aircraft delivering supplies were under constant heavy fire. The military command then launched Operation Niagara, a massive close air support campaign carried out by the 7th Air Force to support the Marines at Quezon and other nearby areas. Fighter aircraft and B-52 bombers dropped tons of explosives and napalm in the surrounding hills to force the NDA to retreat, but the enemy was relentless and kept coming back. Over 9,000 sorties were flown between January and March of 1968 and dropped more than 15,000 tons of bombs. By April, the combat strength of the NBA finally started to show signs of weakness after losing around 9,000 troops from the bombing campaign. But the fighting over Kassan was not over yet, and the Marines were still surrounded. Operation Pegasus After the success of Operation Niagara, Westmoreland ordered General John J. Johnson commander of the 1st Cavalry Division, to begin planning Operation Pegasus. The operation's objective was to relieve the Marines at Quezon by weakening the NBA through a series of air and ground attacks along Route 9. Then, after some firefights, the Marines were able to move out from the base and extend the range of their patrols. In coordination with the Air Cavalry, the U.S. and South Vietnamese began to suffocate the pockets of resistance in the hills. A fierce campaign was eventually launched to decimate the NBA in the Oshaw Valley, and in early June of 1968, the evacuation of Kassan began. Wounded Marines and soldiers were taken away, and undamaged equipment was picked up. The rest was destroyed or left behind. The last Marines were evacuated from Kassan on July 11th under cover of darkness. After 77 days of fighting, the base was finally abandoned. Although the NBA used the evacuation as a propaganda victory, statistics showed the contrary. While the U.S. death toll was less than 300 with 3,000 wounded, Communist forces surpassed 15,000 casualties with 3,000 wounded. Still, the evacuation of Kassan helped fuel the anti-war sentiment back home. Eventually, President Johnson withdrew his candidacy for re-election, and Westmoreland was replaced by General Creighton W. Abrams to lead the MACV. The war would rage on for seven more years. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below what you think of the Siege of Kassan. Do you think it would have been a better option to retreat from the very beginning of the blockade?